We thank you, Lord, for bringing us yet again to another Easter. And we ask you to open our ears, our minds, to the glory of your scriptures. In your name we pray. Amen. Trying to find my place here. <laughs> Uh, okay, Isaiah 65, and we're going to read from 17, verse 17 through 25. For I am about to create, create new heavens and a new earth. The former thing shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jer Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days, or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses, and they shall inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit, they shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. And for like the days of a tree shall the day of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they, shall be off, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord, and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb should feel, shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. And now we go to Luke. And that is chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body, the body of Christ. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were, were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again? Then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James and the other woman with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to be an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb Stooping, he looked in. He saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, 
And then he went home, amazed at what had happened. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Unleash among us and within us, O oh God, your disruptive spirit of generosity and power, just as you raised Jesus from the dead and unleashed your spirit of newness upon the earth, so unleash your Holy Spirit among us that we might be filled with your grace, that we might be filled with your love, filled with your power, that our lives may no longer be complacent or timid or afraid, but that we might live lives of courage and compassion, honesty, truth, and justice. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen On this day, brothers and sisters, the church gathers near the tombs of the world and sings that the grip of fear and death has been nullified for all times and in all situations. Jesus Christ has overcome sin and death and the grave, and because of that, we do not need to be afraid of anything or anyone anymore. In a week that has seen yet another bombing, this time in the city of Brussels, by groups seeking to drive up fear and terror. In that week, Easter is the defiant song of Alleluia, that death never has the last word, fear does not rule our lives, and anxiety is a bad way to live. Death and fear and sin may still strut and swagger around looking to intimidate and bully people, but on Easter, the church stands up and proclaims that we know that they are wrong. Resurrection is our song today, brothers and sisters. Easter tells us that God's core characteristic is resurrection from the dead. According to Easter, the central and defining characteristic of our God is not some philosophical category like omniscience or omnipresence or omnipotence. Now those philosophical categories are fine as far as they go, but they are frankly not all that interesting. A lot of other gods down through the ages have tried to define themselves in those ways. But the place to start, if you want to talk about the God of the Bible, is that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So when someone asks you, tell me what you believe about God, the best place to begin is by saying, well, God raised Jesus from the dead. When we start there, all of the other characteristics of God fall into their proper place. So when you ask yourself, oh, I wonder what God is like, the best place to begin working out your answer, the best place to begin working out your statement of faith if you are a new church officer or if you are someone going through seminary or someone who's thinking about going to seminary, the best place to start is by saying, God raised Jesus from the dead. You start there, and then you begin to work out the implications of that for your own life, for the life of this congregation, and for the world. And if resurrection is the defining characteristic of our God, then the people who follow and adore this God are people who hope. Easter people are hopers. When the world tells us to just give up, Easter people keep at it because 
We are hopers. When the world tells us to forget about some person or some group, to treat them in demeaning ways as outsiders and outcasts who do not deserve to be treated with dignity and that we should not really bother wasting our time on them, Easter people keep on reaching out to them with love and with justice because we are hopers. If the world tries to shame people into thinking that there's no use trying to change things, that the status quo is really the best thing that can be hoped for, Easter people keep at it because we're hopers. There you go. Hope is the stubborn, resilient, and irrepressibly joyful quality of life that makes Easter people distinctive. And brothers and sisters, we need to realize that hope goes a whole lot deeper and is a whole lot stronger than simple optimism. Now, don't get me wrong, I love optimists. Some of my best friends are optimists. Optimism is great as far as it goes, but in our world, with the problems that we are facing as a country, as a planet, optimism is no longer enough. Optimism is the act of looking at a glass and calling it half full. And there's not a thing wrong with that. But what do you do when the glass has been shattered and broken by some bully or by some tragedy or by our own bad behavior? When that happens, and eventually that happens to all of us, when that happens, optimism doesn't have an answer. But when that happens, and that happens to all of us, hopers do not sink into paralysis or despair, but place themselves in the hands of the one who picks up the shattered pieces and puts them together, probably not the same way they used to be, but puts them together in some new way. Hopers do this, and we do it not because we are optimistic people. Some of us probably are optimistic people, but that's not why we do this. Hopers do this because that is what happened in the resurrection of Jesus. On Good Friday, for those early disciples, when their Lord Jesus was executed, their lives were shattered. Their dreams had come to an end. And when those early steadfast and faithful women came to the tomb, Early on the first day of the week, they probably weren't just at the 11 o'clock service. They were probably at like the 4.30 service. When they got there early on the first day of the week, the text says that they came with spices and with ointments, which they had prepared. And they came with these to anoint the dead body of Jesus, to anoint his corpse. Now, their act of doing this was a beautiful act of tender faithfulness. But it was not the act of people who were expecting something new. It was the act of people who had come to mark the end of their story. Their glass was not just half empty. Their glass had been broken to pieces. And when they got there, they see these two men in dazzling clothes who tell them that Jesus is no longer dead, 
but is risen, and in the blink of an eye, the women learn that the shards of shattered glass have been put back together in some new way. The shattered glass has been picked up and reconfigured into something completely fresh and new and surprising. Grief has been turned into joy. And the women leave the tomb, and according to Luke, the first thing they do is to share the news with others. They do not keep the news to themselves, which is to say that the resurrection is not only revealed to us on Easter, but the resurrection summons us on Easter to testify to it with our lives. So we will notice that the angels do not say to the women, they do not say, we've told you these things so that you may have a proper theology of the resurrection. What the angels say to the women is, all things are new, now get out of here and go tell somebody. My colleague, Reverend Dr. Lori Knight Whitehouse, has said, that Christians are Easter people living in a Good Friday world. So brothers and sisters, as you go forth today into our Good Friday world, I invite you this week and in the next chapter of this congregation's life, and for the rest of your lives, I invite you to practice the resurrection, to embody resurrection hope in some concrete ways in your life. I want to invite you to practice resurrection hope in your inward life and in your outward life. And so as an inward practice, I want to invite you to think of some person or some group in the world who comes to your mind, whose situation in life seems hopeless. I want you to call to mind someone or some group in the world whose situation seems hopeless. It may be someone that you know personally whose life is shrouded in darkness in some way right now. Or it could be a situation in the world that the world has given up on and thinks is beyond hope. So you might think of the intractable conflicts and violence in the Middle East and around the world. You might think of the polarization in American politics and in American society and in American families and in American churches. You might think of persons who are living with addiction or living with despair or living with some disease. Hold these persons, whoever or whatever comes to your mind, hold these persons with tenderness but also with perseverance. Hold them in your prayers and know that God's resurrection power is at work even and perhaps especially in those people's lives and in those situations. Now, this is not magical thinking or wishful thinking. What this is doing is this is choosing to trust in God's capacity to do something new that will be surprising. And as an outward expression or an outward practice of resurrection hope, I invite you this week, and be a little creative here, but I invite you to take some kind of action this week that for you embodies resurrection hope. So do something unexpected for yourself, something that will surprise your friends and family. Speak up when a situation is trying to pressure you to keep silent. Laugh a lot. 
Forgive someone who has done some wrong to you. Feed the poor. Or write a letter to your congressional representatives on behalf of a cause in which you believe. All of these things and a gazillion other things are ways of testifying to your willingness to trust in the promise of the resurrection. Brothers and sisters, vibrant, joy-filled life is available right now. Even as we engage in the hardships and the suffering and the pain of the world, the good news, and this really is fabulous, fabulous news, this is really fabulous news, the news is that we do not have to wait until we die in order to experience the fruits, the blessings, and the benefits of the resurrection. The fruits and the benefits and the blessings of the resurrection are available right here, right now. New life, new courage, new resilience, that's available to us by the grace of God. Jesus Christ has overcome sin and death and the grave and because of that, we do not have to be afraid of anyone or anything anymore. To God and to God alone be all of the glory. Amen. Friends, let us pray. We offer ourselves to you, O oh God. We offer ourselves to you with our courage and our fidelity and our trust. We also bring to you the cynicism and the confusion and the fears that still lurk around in our lives. We bring ourselves to you, O oh God, for we know that you are able to do far more with us than we could ever do on our own. And so we pray that you would open up our hearts, open up our minds to be courageous enough to take the risk of letting your grace get inside of us so that we might be changed, transformed more and more into the likeness of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.